never too old for a pony ride. Never too old for a pony ride. No, you're never too old for a pony ride. No, you're never too old for a pony ride. They're kind of like a horse, but they're smaller. A giraffe is like a pony, but its neck is taller. If you want to ride, just give me a holler. All rides are a dollar. Oh, you're never too old for a pony ride. No, you're never too old. song is just fraught with meaning. Has anybody ever used the term fraught on anything other than fraught with meaning? Hey guys, I am early tonight, in case you didn't notice that. There's going to be a bunch of people that are going to show up later and be like, oh shoot, we missed him. <laughs> but Joel is here. Oh, and there's my phone. Sorry, I gotta hang up. I'm live on the internet. All right, so Joel says, what are your thoughts on placing a deer salt lick next to a coconut palm? No seaweed in Claremont, Florida. Better gardening through experimentation. I would totally do it. Uh, I mean, if uh, you know it's edible, right, to animals, which means that it's probably not going to be that toxic to plants, if at all. Um, uh, I would check and see, though, you know, it, is it predominantly sodium chloride? Because a big thing that they're missing is chlorine, of all things. That's that's what uh, the, the coconut palms like when they're inland. So it's worth, um, it's worth trying. Uh, it's probably sodium chloride with a bunch of other stuff in it. Probably a bunch of trace minerals, which would almost certainly be great. I wouldn't worry about it at all. I'd give it a try. I'd just do it. Yes, I am early. I am I am early tonight because I'm going out to play live uh, this evening. I'm taking my wife out on a date. We're going to go out and play. And uh, so I said, you know what? I better just run this thing early. So I'm sorry, guys, for those of you that are expecting me later, if I'm interrupting everybody's schedules and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just want to go out and play my guitar and take my wife out on a date. So, yeah, I'm early. <laughs> Natasha says, hope I can listen. I have a fussy baby on the hip and trying to cook. Hopefully can listen, if not later when milking. Yeah, fussy babies um, fussy babies are very important to take care of. And sometimes they nothing else can get in the way. If you don't believe that people are basically evil, you probably have never raised children. We are basically evil. You have to work on it to, um, to, <laughs> to go good. You don't have to work on it to be evil. Children are very, very adorable. Babies are adorable, but they're incredibly selfish. They're evil. They're kind of a cute evil, though, so it's all right. All right, so um, I had I've been getting some questions lately. I'm always getting a bunch of questions, and uh, and you know between between YouTube and uh, the blog, and then email, uh, I get emailed a lot of questions too. So I'm just kind of gonna go through some questions I got because I, I got some good ones lately and I figured <laughs> they're adorable only when asleep oh no when they when they like try to focus a little baby tries to focus on your face and they're like oh that is so cute all right so I got this question here we'll start out with this oh I should tell you guys what I did today I went over and I sprayed uh, copper sulfate and soybean oil on uh, a few trees that were infested with both um, black mold and mealy, little mealy bugs and ants that were spreading around. So it's like the ants place these little cows onto the things just like they do with aphids. They put their little, they protect the little bugs 
and they take the sweet excretions from the bugs. They basically use them like cattle. And then the the little bit, all that sweet excretion, all the little droppings coming out of those stupid things um, end up causing black fungus to form all over the leaves. So you get this black, nasty thing. It's really common on citrus. So I have a couple of older grapefruit trees that are making really sweet fruit, but a lot of the leaves, all the new leaves are getting destroyed. So today I went over with a pump sprayer and finally did it. I've been meaning to get around to it, but it's been raining um, for a couple of days. And so we had a nice dry day today. I said, this is it, I'm gonna go spray them. So I sprayed for both the fungus and the insects at the same time. And both of the products were um, OMRI certified. So that means that it's basically organic sort of. Um, copper sulfate is the bomb if you ever have a problem. And the, the plants actually kind of like it too. So some of them do. All right, so, um, that's what I did, and I filmed a video, too, of me not using proper safety protocols with uh, copper sulfate, of course. So, look, my first question here. Oh, the volume's low? All right. Let me see if I can turn this up. How's that? Is that better? I am, like, hitting the peak right now. All right. Let's try right there. That should be that should be better. I could, I could be more like, a, more like a radio studio here. I'll go like that. All right. So... Um, this is this has definitely a proximity effect going on. This is a studio mic that I use for audiobook stuff. All right, so here is our first one. I got this question from a friend of mine. And he says, I just wanted to check with you and see if you have had yam potatoes like what I have. Most look fine, but a few are more like a gherkin pickle and not what I expected to get. Before I plant and poison myself, take a look at the photo and let me know if I should discard the irregular looking ones. It's the long skinny ones that scare me. All right, now let me show you these. These are um, these are the bulbils from the yams that he grew. Yeah, those things look poisonous, don't they? Those things look like they'd kill you. Yeah, I wouldn't eat those things. They look like petrified snakes and organs. But actually, those are those are legit. Those are all Dioscoria alata. The alata bulbils, that's the greater yam. That's the yam I, I regularly grow. It makes a great big yam in the ground. And they grow these little things that hang up on the vines. This, this variety, all the alatas are edible. I've never heard of a non-edible alata. But there's a lot of variability in the shape of the aerial roots that they make. Some of them come out long and thin. Some of them are like bulbous and look like multiple bits tried to grow at the same time. Some of them are, are small and round. and some of, So you can see there's a lot of variation. And, and he's very right to be concerned because there is um, a very, very similar looking plant, which is the non-edible, the, the wild or poisonous version of Dioscoria bulbifera. And that one here, here's a picture from toptropicals.com. By the way, Top Tropicals is a great nursery. So I'm going to plug them right now and say toptropicals.com because I totally stole their picture off the net. So it should be okay with them that I stole their picture because I mentioned them nicely. They have some good stuff. All right, so these are the these things look like they'd be good and edible. They look just like potatoes, don't they? Except they contain a huge amount of diasgenin, which is a hormone that uh, can cause hair loss and sterility not to, venture, not to mention lots and lots of vomiting. They actually uh, extract it and use it in birth control pills. And as we know, birth control pills come from the Illuminati. So you don't want to uh, mess with these things. These guys that look bad are actually fine. These are Dioscoria alata. These ones that look great are Dioscoria bulbifera, and you don't want those. Those are bad. Those are bad. So don't don't get them mixed up. Now, I'm, it gets even more complicated than that because there are purple, white, and yellow versions of Dioscoria alata. There are dark colored versions of Dioscoria bulbifera, and there are um, there are edible varieties of Dioscoria bulbifera. This one, but they don't look like that. They have weird angles all over them. So. It's really a good idea to know uh, when you're plant foraging or when you're gardening with things that you aren't familiar with that, you know, all the variations and potential problems that could arise. Otherwise, you're in, you know, you could be in big trouble. So there we go. That uh, these are fine. Go ahead and plant them. They will make roots. 
and they will be good to eat roots. If you find these things, don't plant them. All right, now I got this other question, which is a good one. Yes, Nancy, I am early because I've got a I've got a date tonight with this hot lady. So I decided I'm going to just do this early. Sorry, everybody's going to be showing up at uh, at six EST and going. Oh no, he's already gone. He's hanging out, drinking gin and tonics, and playing guitar. All right, so here is another good question. Uh. I was written today, somebody said, someone told me yesterday when grapefruit skins are put in the compost, it negatively affects the worms in the compost. I'd like your take on adding grapefruit skins to a regular compost, please. Sometimes one of my trash donors makes a big orange juice and I get the peels. I've been tossing them in with all the rest. Am I doing my lovely compost a disservice? And he also, I told him, you know what, I would just throw them in the compost. Uh, I mean, if all of your compost was orange peels, the worms might not like it, uh, or grapefruit peels, or whatever. Um, there, There is this kind of, I'd say it's misinformation. It's, you know, this. it's, it's one of those compost police rules. Yes, the compost popo. <laughs> it's one of those compost police things where you don't, don't put citrus in your compost. If you put citrus in your compost, it's bad. We're going to have to throw all the compost out. It's almost as bad as sausages. I mean, um, yeah, I, and I think the reason is people noticed with vermicomposting, that is composting with worms, that um, if you've got a lot of citrus going into it, the, the worms don't like to eat it right away. You know, they really don't. So um, they... Uh, they will just kind of skip it and avoid it, and they will eat it later, actually, once it molds over and starts going, you know, and there are also, you know, citrus oils that have been used for insecticides and that sort of thing. So people, you know, people in the vermicomposting side probably noticed that their worms weren't exactly enthusiastic about eating orange peels. So, you know, they like to eat watermelon better, but of course I do too, you know, but, I, you know, I understand the worms, I feel for the worms. However... As they break down, the worms will eat them eventually. And if you are, you know, there, there's actually a decent amount of nutrition in those orange peels. It's good for the compost. Um, orange pulp and sludge and peels will heat up a pile very nicely. There's a lot of sugars in there, you know, that um, will feed the fungi, etc. I mean, if you if you peel them and let the peels sit out, you'll see them turn all green with the mold pretty quickly and start breaking down. So. No, I would I would simply throw them all in there. If you get a ton of them, just add more brown material. The worms will move in and out of the pile as they're happy. If you have a vermicompost system, I wouldn't feed it a ton of peels. I would just give it a little bit. But in your regular compost, throw them in. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. All right, let's see if we've got any questions here. Kyler says, so I'm growing animal feed corn in a plant pot. That sounds like fun. Uh, I've had a difficulty with them actually making good sized ears and pots. Uh, Leaf asks, hi, any fertilizer I could use for artichoke so I can artichoke bulbs on top? Not sure. I actually haven't grown artichoke because I've never been in the right climate for it. Uh, and I'm not sure if it gets to a certain height or it grows taller. I just honestly can't tell you because I've, I've never been in a place where it really is it really grows. So... Brian Rosado asks, does the salt kill bacteria in the mycelium? As in the salt that you might throw around a, um, a coconut palm? Possibly, but it seems like there are bacteria and fungi and, um, you know, and organisms that are suited to almost every environment. And, you know, the coconut palms like to be on the beach. So the most important thing is making the coconut palm happy. So if you had extra salt... You know, and, it, and it's not happy about that. Uh, you know, the mycelium aren't happy. I don't really care that much um, because the coconut's going to be happy, and that's what I'm shooting for in that case. But uh, generally, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, a lot of it, probably, yes, you know. Kyler says, so I just made a terrarium with pathos and green peppers. The peppers seed leaves, I think that's seedlings, are growing mold now. Uh, not quite sure why. Probably way too much moisture. 
Um, in high high moisture without enough air circulation, the fungi will just overwhelm plants and destroy them. <clears throat> Megostein says, my chickens free range in my backyard food forest. Do they get to the earthworms or are those deeper beyond chicken's reach? Thank you, Dave. Uh, they will get some earthworms if uh, if the earthworms are are circulating up into like like you know when there's a bunch of leaf matter or mulch and that sort of thing if they kick it around and they find a worm they're gonna nail them but uh generally the worms tend to stay a little bit underneath and worms are very good at pulling themselves down into the ground when they you know um when they're disturbed i'm sure they're getting a few i would not worry about it um because worms are actually very good at reproducing if you have enough organic matter they're going to just keep coming back And um, the the uh, chickens are also going to eat a bunch of pests too. Like they'll they'll get um, cutworms and other things too. Brian says, "Did you know you can make a drink out of wandering Jew? They make it in Mexico, and it's good for your kidneys. I have heard it's medicinal. I haven't tried it." Uh, Careless Whisper said, "Have you grown loofah gourd? I actually grew um, the loofah angulata or whatever that is. The, the one that looks like the the Graf Zeppelin." You know the zeppelin that crashed. Um, the it has these these heavy ridges on it, and it is not good for a scrub brush because it's really really hard to take off the outer husk of it. However, it is a really good cooked vegetable. And then when I moved down here, I found some loofahs growing wild, and I recognized them as being the regular loofah. And I took some of the young loofah fruit and I chopped them up, and my wife stir fried them and cooked them. And when we ate them, it was it was pretty bitter, and I was like, "Wow, this is really bitter." I wonder what's going on. But I didn't want to waste the food because she had, you know, like meat and vegetables and all kinds of stuff in there. So I ate the rest of it. And then, like for the next day, we had like vomiting, flu. It was horrible. It was like having dysentery for a ugh, for a day. And it turns out it was cucurbitacin poisoning. So if you ever get a bitter loofah, don't eat it. Um, my friend Gary back in uh, South Florida, he's he's gone to meet his maker now unfortunately he was a kind of a crazy plant guy lived on the street a lot of the time but he had this big plant collection and uh and he knew i liked plants and so like we spoke the same language so he at one point was renting a room and he planted loofahs all along this back fence and he just had tons and tons of them they covered the entire fence and the landlord actually got upset at him but you know crazy plant people are crazy plant people <laughs> and loofah is very easy to grow uh oh i see you say reason i ask is last year i grew the vine tons of foliage but zero fruiting until frost killed it it seems to be i think it's day length sensitive because i've noticed that they don't seem to start fruiting until late in the season um like coming towards winter so it may be you have to check and see if there's a if there are day length sensitive or not day length sensitive versions are there quick producing varieties because i had the same problem with pigeon peas they wouldn't bloom and fruit until too late so um i i never got much of anything off of them uh true fu fo file says i'm germinating my first tobacco seeds today is cocoa core good for tobacco uh, I don't know that straight cocoa core would be great. I would like, um, I usually m use a mix of compost, maybe a little peat or a, or a potting mix, something nice and light. Um, but you could try it. I'm just afraid that it, it's just all one thing. It may not be the best. Uh, Eric Hale said, I put oranges in my worm bin and never had an issue. Good. Yeah, that's great. I put an entire watermelon in the worm bin once that was spoiling. And... Um, then I forgot about it and it flooded the worm bin and all the worms ran away. Like I found them crawling all underneath the furniture and stuff. It was not good. <laughs> LaRue OBR 556. Good round. Talking tomatoes, it is, is it bad to let lawn sprinklers water them early in the morning? No, I don't think so because uh, that, that would mimic, rather mimic nature. You know, the dew uh, is forming on them overnight and so they're getting they're getting a little bit of water. I wouldn't worry about watering them early in the morning. They're going to dry out during the day. If you're in an area with very high humidity, you might worry about it more. But um, I, I water morning, evening, and night whenever I think about it. And I, I ever haven't really had much more trouble watering at different times of the day. But um, it's it may depend on your climate too. So. 
Uh, let's see. What do you do with the brown pigeon peas other than plant? Well, you can cook them. You can cook them. Um, and they're they're like like a dry bean. You know, you soak them and you cook them. I don't find that they agree with my digestion very much. I feel like I have indigestion when I eat pigeon peas, so I don't eat them very often. I like the green ones better. But um, the cooked ones are a lot like, like you make beans and rice with them, basically. Peas and rice, you know. Ridge gourd, yeah, angle loofah. Uh, VFM9736 says, what's the best way to amend black clay soil? Pretty much the best thing to do for, for most soils, uh, but particularly clay, is to get some organic matter into it so it's fluffier and lighter. So if you stack a bunch of organic matter on top uh, in the fall and the winter and you just kind of let it rot down in the spring and it starts turning, the soil underneath will loosen up a lot and it's easier to plant into Another thing you can do if you want to be really serious, like if you're having some issues with things growing well, is to take some take some of the soil and send it to uh, a laboratory, like um, I think it's Roper Labs. They will give you a complete write-up of every mineral in the soil that's important for plant growth and tell you what it's deficient in and what it's high in. And that is actually a huge help because then you can start balancing and you can make sure the plants have totally everything they need. Uh, let's see. Kyle Bronstein says, where would I find out what plants I should use to make a forest in central Florida sandy soil? Actually, my book, uh, Create Your Own Florida Food Forest, which I have around here somewhere. I don't know where I put it. This book right here. This book right here, I have a list and the appendix. The appendix is like the best thing of it. Um, <laughs> I've got this appendix right here. Fruiting trees and other tasty edibles for South Florida right here. And then the North Central Florida Gardening Cheat Sheet gives you how the stupid easy stuff that's like really easy to grow down to the very difficult stuff according to what I tested and tried. I've also got a list of berries for the tropics and subtropics, um, greens for Florida, and a list of fruiting trees and other tasty edibles for South Florida, and useful North Central Florida species from canopy trees, Let's see, you can see that here. Oh, yeah, canopy trees, understory trees, shrub layer, vine layer, all that stuff. This book is like 10 bucks, I think, on Amazon. Um, but they're, like I said the other night in the food forest, um, the food forest talk I gave, if you find out what's growing locally and find out what's growing commercially locally, like find the wild plants that are edible or useful or have relatives that are edible or useful and plant those, and go and find out what's growing commercially in orchard spaces, um, berry farms, whatever else, and then start looking for those things and mixing them in. And you're you're probably not going to go very far wrong. Alan says, "I'm finally not late, and I'm late. Yeah, I got I got a date tonight, so I'm I started earlier." Deanna says, "Can we send you seeds? Or is that not allowed? I I'll get in trouble. Like like things will get confiscated." Um, there's a lot of agriculture that could be disrupted by viruses and that sort of thing, so the government is not does not like it when things come in. People smuggle stuff, but it's brought in diseases that have been really bad, so I really appreciate it though. Lori says, chickpeas bother my stomach. Yeah, me too. Uh, what can you get onto Chickasaw Plum? I'm, I'm, what can you graft onto Chickasaw Plum? I'm your Huckleberry. By the way, I'm your Huckleberry. Thank you very much for pointing out that on my website, the link to the Homegrown Food Summit 2019 was going to a 404. There was, uh, it was not recognizing the link. So because you pointed it out, I was able to fix it today. So thank you very much for that. And if anybody wants to see my two presentations at the Homegrown Food Summit 2019, along with a bunch of other free presentations, you can sign up. There's a link below this video, which hopefully does not take you to a 404. So what can you graft onto Chickasaw Plum? Basically, you can graft most of the stone fruits, except cherries. You can graft uh, European plums. You can graft uh, Japanese plums. You can graft on peaches and nectarines and probably apricots, but they don't, use, they don't really share the same climate, so... Um, I don't know if you'll be able to get apricots to put on there or if they'll bloom properly. But it's it's almost a, it's, 
You know, it's like it's it's as good as a peach root stock. It'll take a lot of things. Was that a planted question? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, Fidel Nation, send them over. I don't mind. Yes, can I raid your stream with my subscribers? Yeah, welcome. And it's nice to see you here. Uh, Christoph Smith says, Hey, David, your take on vegan organic farming slash permaculture slash food forests, etc. Oh, well, I'm, I don't believe in veganism, um, but I do think that that the primary the primary limitation uh, on on the, a lot of the food forest systems is that okay you might have a lot of greens you might have a lot of fruits but you don't necessarily have enough complicated carbohydrates so I would really concentrate also in protein um, nuts olives uh, root crops things that things that are going to to satiate you fill you up and predominantly you know they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna fill you up. Um, and like nuts are very valuable for, for as a high amount of energy. Um, avocados are another one. So you want to concentrate on that sort of stuff first and maybe be a little lighter on the fruits and vegetables. Once you get your core stuff in there, like I'm a meat eater, so it doesn't matter. I have a bunch of fruit, whatever. Um, I have a bunch of vegetables. I'm looking for, um, nutrient dense and fiber and flavor and that sort of thing. But if you're going to get a lot of your calories out of it, you have to plant the highest calories, highest value calorie stuff first. So you know, look for look for perennial vegetables um, that will make roots, or perennial um, perennials like nuts and avocados, that sort of thing first. That's that's what I would do. <clears throat> I like the question; it's a very interesting question. You know, calories first and nutrition after that. Uh, Melinda says, hey, David, the Growing Your Greens guy mentioned you on his video of a natural farm. Yes, actually, uh, if you guys go and check out John Kohler's latest video, he went to, thanks to um, the many recommendations I got, we narrowed it down, and he went to a natural farm in Howie in the Hills when he was in Florida, and he filmed, and he gave us good gardeners a shout-out. So, hooray. Um, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Amy K says, my new baby trees are just starting to get buds on them because it has been warm and we were getting that last, hopefully, overnight frost down to 28 degrees. Should I protect them? Yes, absolutely protect them. Like, go out there and throw sheets on them now. If, if it's going to, don't, do it. Do it. Like, and if it's, uh, you'll lose those blooms and you'll lose the fruit for the year. And that's, that's just so sad. Cover them. And uh, if you think it's going to get any colder, put a 55-gallon drum next to the one you really want to care about, fill it full of water, and then cover that with a, with a blanket or a sheet. doesn't matter. Blanket, sheet, carton. <clears throat> uh, Adam says, D to the G, coffee question. I have a potted coffee tree about six foot tall on patio in Broward. It may be getting too much sun slash heat. Would you recommend planting it under three large palms in my front yard? Yeah, you know, they seem to appreciate a little bit of shade. I kept mine in half shade, and it would fruit quite happily there. They will grow in full sun, but uh, they actually have to adjust to it, I've heard, like over time. And they, they, don't, they just don't seem to love it. So, yes, I would put it under those palms. I would also make sure that it has a big enough pot um, to, to, you know, so it's, so it's not going through drought stress. Because I, I had a lot of trouble with mine getting root bound and then, um, drying out too fast, and then I would have to dip the whole bucket into another container full of water to soak it back up again. All right, I will get back to these questions in a minute. I've got another one here that I want to show you guys. This is Mart Mart Hale, my friend, the uh, the mad genius of Summerfield, Florida. See what this thing is? <laughs> There's actually a column of flame coming up that central pipe. And heating, it's like a it's like a flaming torch that he created. He made a just a huge like a push through rocket stove. So it's like a T going up, and he put uh, foam crete in the center and piping and a big metal plate on top. And he did it so he could use entire chunks of bamboo and just shove them through. And the ashes come out one side, and the fresh wood goes in the other side. So it's really cool. I put a link to the video. It's just weird. It's really kicking hot. And uh, I mean, it's like, it's just, 
It's like those uh, torches that they they light to send hot air balloons up. It's very cool. And along those lines, Green Shards DIY, who's one of us uh, good gardeners here, he's on the stream pretty often. He designed this rocket stove. It actually disassembles into pieces. It's all flat, and they all go flat, and they can be shipped in a box. It's like six inches by nine inches or something like that. So it's a, a small portable rocket stove that you could set up anywhere and you can fuel it with pine cones and sticks and that sort of thing and cook and boil water over it. I thought that was really cool. Um, he's got it on Amazon and uh, and I, any, any, any of you guys doing something cool, I'm like totally happy to promote it and point it out. So if you get a chance, check out the link on Amazon below that goes to his Rocket King rocket stove which folds into pieces and he is um, going to send me one so I'm going to test it out. So if it turns out really bad, that's it. I'm not going to mention it anymore. So it better be really good. <laughs> All right, I'll take a few more questions here. All right. Uh, I'm going to go here. Let's see. Uh, I planted uh, Bajan Home Gardener says. Behan, Behan, Home Gardener, Home Hardener, Home Hard, Behan, Badgen, Badgen, Home Gardener says, it reminds me of uh, Faulty Towers, Badgen, I planted some bell peppers, I'm sorry, in between my strawberries, I found that the strawberries around them grew taller as if competing, whilst the peppers are yellowing, do you think I should remove the peppers? My bet is that the uh, pepper's roots are getting chewed up by something. That usually seems to be the case. They seem to be really susceptible to, like, um, some root pests, maybe nematodes. Um, pull one of those bell peppers out if they don't look like they're going to do anything and look at the roots and see if they look all gnarled up or chewed up or rotted. Sometimes plants work really beautifully together, and sometimes they're just not happy. Like when I tried to grow sweet potatoes around blueberries, and uh, the blueberries really didn't want to grow for like two or three years because the sweet potatoes, apparently, the root disruption, they really didn't like it. So I, I learned through observation not to do that anymore. Um, Adam says, I've also, I've got eight pineapples coming up, hopefully as ginormous as my last one. Yeah, Adam sent me a picture of this awesome pineapple and uh, his cute little daughter with this like, massive pineapple. And it's like, here's my first pineapple. I'm like, dude, that's like beyond commercial pineapple success there. That's very good. Good work. Uh, let's see. Uh, Carolyn says, I am, gonna get, I am getting the USB drive so I can watch the Food Summit anytime. Yeah, the Homegrown Food Summit, they, they always have, they're really good at getting experts. And I don't just say that because they always invite me back. Um, I, I have really enjoyed some of the presentations I've seen, and I'll, I'll catch them and watch them with Rachel during uh, during the week. Because you can watch basically the way it works is you can watch for free during the week, and then you can get like 48 presentations on a USB for some amount of money. Um, so you can get all of these presentations. So you know Joel Salatin and Justin Rhodes and all these guys they do they do things where Stacy Murphy's on there. She's she's sharp and she's good at growing tomatoes, which I am not that great at growing tomatoes. So. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few interesting people. Justin Rohner's on there. All right. Do Chickasaw Plum and the American Persimmon taste good to grow them? Brian asks. That's a good question. Some of the Chickasaw Plums that I've tried have been sweet and good, and some of them are very tart. All of them you can make good Chickasaw Plum jam out of. Um, there was this lady that made killer jam. She would pick them all along the railroad tracks near Ocala, and uh and and get all of them and just just take baskets of them and make you know local jam which was really cool um but you know tartar fruit are actually better for jam you know they get a better flavor when you put the sugar in them there's a nice balance there so some of them are sweet and nice some of them are not because there's a lot of there's a lot of like kind of variation it's um prunus angustifolia i think is the name of it and the the variation is there from sour to sweet so they're they're pretty good, um, but some of them don't produce very much. I uh, my my tree barely made any, so I was very happy to graft it. And some of them are just loaded; they look like a cherry tree. So it's genetic variation. So yes and no, they're good, and sometimes they're sour. Uh, do the American persimmon taste good? Yeah, I really like American persimmons. 
problem is, is they tend to be small and they're quite astringent until they're fully ripe. So if you get one that's not fully ripe, like getting squishy, uh, it will just turn your mouth to cotton and it's, it's very unpleasant. They're a good fruit and there are there were improved varieties of it that were being bred years ago and most of those old varieties have been lost and nobody's done much work with the tree. Very unfortunate. Um, J. Russell Smith in his book Tree Crops talks about how they were breeding oaks to be an excellent nut tree. Look at how many acorns they produce, but the acorns are too high in tannins. Well, some, some oaks were found to have sweet acorns, so they were trying to breed them up as a nut. Sweet, large acorns that you could just eat fresh from the tree. There are varieties that are like that, but people didn't continue the breeding projects. They ended up cutting them all down and planting corn instead. So, you know, short-sightedness on their part. You can, you can take some of these wild plants and breed them up into wonderful things. The reason I, I generally think, you know, if you have space, put in American persimmons, but generally I would say put in a Japanese persimmons because the tree's a lot smaller, it can be kept smaller, has much larger fruit, they're very consistent and very good, and it is uh, self-pollinating, whereas the American persimmon is dioecious, meaning they're male and female, and you have to have both to get it to pollinate, and the trees get quite big. So there's a few downsides to it that make it, it's a good wild foraging food, but it's not as great for your yard or food forest, unless you just want a beautiful tree, or you got space for it, then do it. I, I had them in my yard too, but uh, I would have kept them chopped small. Shannon Hudson says, hi, why are some of my tomato truss be bending and crimping the stem. Is it phosphorus issue? I bought clips that are sold to support. I think you mean trunk, but I thought it may be a nutrient issue. Uh, send me a picture. You may have um, amino pyrrolid contamination or something. Send me a photo if you get a chance. David at FloridaFoodForests.com and I'll tell you what's going on. Yeah, Leaf says, I saw John Kohler's video of him mentioning you in his video for the Natural Farm Nursery Tour. I said it. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> Here comes Fidel Nation. That's hilarious. Hey guys, awesome. <laughs> yeah, Fidel's the bomb, man. Good job, good Raiders. Nice to see you guys here. I want my money, by the way. <laughs> All right, so. Burr oak has sort of sweet nuts, yes. Uh, Leo Rowley says, Dave, any tips on growing pineapples? Yeah. Um, I think mulch is really nice with pineapples because otherwise they tear you up so much when you go and try and weed them. You get all shredded and, and uh, you know, you've got to wear gloves and long sleeves, pain in the neck. I like mulch. Um, they seem to like compost. They also like, like mild uh, compost tea and you just pour it in the center of them to feed them. They actually are a lot like an air plant. They're in the same family, uh, they're bromeliad, so they're kind of strange. You can side dress with manures and stuff like that, but if you put anything too hot in the center of them, they just die. Um, I, I would plant them, they don't, like it. they don't like to be super wet, that'll cause them to rot. I don't recommend rooting them in water. I recommend cutting the tops off and sticking them right in the ground and pushing dirt around them and letting them grow. Also, once they produce one pineapple, they tend to cluster and they'll start making more pineapples. So don't think that just because they made one, they don't anymore. So there's my, there's my knowledge on pineapples. Noel says, I've always used the standard bulk bark mulch from the garden center, which often grows a weird yellow fungus on warm days. Yeah, it's probably slime mold. Stuff is cool. Uh, other sources for mulch when your compost pile is small. Yeah, I grew, um, I grew a lot of plants. If you look at my, I did a, uh, a whole live stream on mulch uh, last week, so go check it out. Um, there's a lot of info on mulch, growing mulch, and finding different things. Liberty Not License says, I'd like a Fuyu and a Jibutacaba. I'll be in Palm Beach Sunday. Anyone know a good nursery there I might try? I'm not sure about Palm Beach, but uh, Spikes Grove Nursery in Davie is nice. They're good, but I'm sure there's some good ones up there in Palm Beach, too. There's a lot of tropical fruit nurseries. Um, see if they have, like, a, a rare fruit council or something in Palm Beach. Pastor Don, Don Elburn says, I have five pineapples in pots, two and a half years old, never fruited yet. You're close, though. Um, they should start, they should start, for, if they're nice and big, they should probably fruit this year. If you really want them to fruit uh, quickly, you can cheat. 
You can peel apples and put the apple peels around the base of the pineapples and they release a gas, ethylene gas, which will stimulate the pineapples into fruiting. I learned this from a very old lady. Um, I, I, helped her, uh, I helped her with uh, when I was a teenager pass around um, flyers for Pat Buchanan's presidential run and then later she voted for Ross Perot so she was like, you know, way out there and uh, um, uh, she she was like out there in her yard and she's just peeling apples and throwing throwing these apple peels all around the thing and I'm like I, I, I was kind of scared of her, you know like, because um, she's really intense and I, I'm like so what are, you, what are you doing? she goes, I'm making them fruit I said, with apple peels? She's like, yes. You put the apple peels around them, it'll make them fruit. I was like, really? Uh, yeah, okay. That's crazy. But I'm like, I'm not going to say that's crazy. I don't know. I mean, she voted for Pat Buchanan and Ross Perot. I mean, she's, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to question anything. I'm just, just a kid. So, anyway, I found that out later. Um, that it's the ethylene gas. She was totally right. Probably on everything. So, yep. Um, that's cool. So, that's, uh. That's what I know about that. So you may actually get them to do it. Yeah, if the plants are huge, they're ready. They, they can produce a pineapple. If they're small and they produce a pineapple, they produce a small pineapple. But uh, if they're huge, yeah, they'll totally jump. They probably. They, I would not be surprised if they started blooming like in the next month because it's that time of year. So uh, Raven says, David, so can I grow pineapples up north in big pots? Yes, you can. Look at my website, thesurvivalgardener.com, and look up growing pineapples. I have an article just on that. So. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, I have another um, I have another question here. This is actually, this is a good question. Uh, a woman wrote me and said, Hey David, I love your videos and books. I was binge watching a few weeks ago and you mentioned you used to have achy, painful joints before you started something. What was that again? Mine are hurting and I'm not sure what I'm doing differently lady, lately. So this is, uh, this is interesting. Um, some years ago, I actually went vegetarian for a year. I have to confess that. I just decided to try it. And... Um, I did, I did terribly. I felt terrible, but I, uh, I did do it for a year. So I know, I know, I know that it can be done, but, um, I was not, I was actually trying to see if I could, uh, lose weight and get in better shape. I had kind of gotten, I had a desk job in my twenties. And as I was getting to the end of my twenties, I was starting to put on some weight and I was like, man, I don't want to be that overweight middle-aged guy. And, but so I was trying to like eat healthy. So I'm looking at all this healthy stuff. What do you eat? You eat rice. You eat a lot of whole grains. So I was eating rice and whole grains and you know potatoes and uh, bags of corn chips. You know all the all the normal the staples of the food pyramid. And uh, and then you know I was eating a lot of vegetables. And I just I just was like not able to get rid of this weight. And I had joint pain. And I had this constant. Uh, heartburn and I couldn't figure out what was going on and so the heartburn thing was just driving me nuts I'm like why do I always have heartburn oh, I feel awful and I'm like doing this all day you know and I'm like oh drinking uh, I would drink baking soda you know baking soda and water like every day to try and knock it back I'm like why what is wrong so I said okay I'm gonna quit I'm not gonna drink any beer because I heard that you know beer can be bad or whatever so no beer no alcohol didn't make any difference. So then I just said, okay, well, I drink black coffee every day. I'm going to quit the coffee. Well, that was really hard, but I did it. Quit the coffee. No change. I quit spicy foods. No change. I'm just like, why do I, why can I not get rid of this, this heartburn? I mean, I wasn't even thinking about my achy joints at that point or the fact that I was overweight. I was just, it was actually just the heartburn that was killing me. So I looked up uh, all this stuff and you know what causes heartburn blah 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 that made almost no uh, no no dent in it nothing I did and uh, so people were like oh you need to go get uh, medication for it I'm like no I'm not gonna maybe you have acid reflux you probably have acid reflux you need to get a medication no I'm not gonna do that there's got to be something so I woke up one morning you know and I didn't have heartburn yet I was feeling all right I sat down for breakfast and 
I'm going to prove this here. Melinda just left a, a thing. So I, uh, I, look, I, I was just eating my breakfast, and I'm eating my toast, my whole wheat toast, and I get about halfway through this piece of toast, and I'm like, man, sorry to get that heartburn again. This is so weird. And then I looked up bread, heartburn. And I find out that like wheat is super acidifying. And I'm like, no way. No way. Come on. Toast? Toast is giving me heartburn? So uh, I, I came across this guy, uh, Mark Sisson, who did this website called Mark's Daily Apple. And it was the primal diet, you know, from back when we all lived in caves. And we were still allowed to, like, drag women around by the hair before Me Too and all that stuff, you know. And, uh, and I'm like... This is this this seems like a bunch of crazy uh, you know caveman stuff or whatever. So I look at it. I'm like, but but he's you know this guy's ripped, and uh, you know there's like nice pictures of people people looking healthy and stuff. And you know I'm like okay, uh, I will just try this because it, it was I think it was on his site that I came across the the bread you know causing heartburn. So I quit all grains, almost all carbs and and all that, and I just ate like meat and vegetables. For six weeks. <laughs> Raven says, David, women used to drag men around too. No, I believe it. I saw your garden video. <laughs> so anyhow, I um I uh I, I like I just quit it and I ended up losing thirty pounds. I lost my gut, I lost thirty pounds, I gained energy, and about it was at about the six week point, suddenly all my joints quit hurting and they just they just like suddenly I woke up in the morning and I felt great. And it took like two or three days, and the heartburn went away. So, it ended up just being um, it ended up just being that I, I cannot handle the the wheat very well. So I have one of those like trendy hipster things. But what she's asking here about the sore joints, um, the two from what I've read, the two two of the most inflammatory things we eat, other than sugar, because everybody's like binging on sugar, um, the Wheat and potatoes. Potatoes are actually quite inflammatory. It was really funny because I, I was talking to somebody about that. And uh, and he said, oh, man, this friend of mine, he's always got joint pain. And he's not that old. And I said, does he eat a lot of potatoes? And he goes, dude, you wouldn't believe this guy. He brings raw potatoes to work and he che- he eats them with his lunch. I'm like, you seriously? <laughs> he's eating raw potatoes with lunch. Now, it's funny because after going on the primal thing and the low-carb thing, he, eating nutrient-dense food, more fat, more protein. I threw out the food pyramid. I quit all the grains. I uh, I lost all that weight and I got healthy and I, I got skinny again. And I was like, this is so weird, you know, because because I felt like I had tried so many different things. I tried calorie restriction and whatever, trying to feel better, and it just didn't make any difference. Uh, Mart Hale says potatoes and tomatoes, everything in the nightshade family, inflammation. So, yeah, I I I just barely eat any sugar. Like when I'm drinking tea. I'm drinking it just straight. I drink black coffee, um, you know, vodka, zero carb. So the two things that I, I told her, I said, look, I said potatoes and wheat are probably the primary ones. Try eliminating one or the other or both and seeing if there's a difference. Everybody's made differently. I'm not going to say it's like the it's magic, but I do think like I could eat all I want. I can eat all I want if I'm eating fat and protein and and I don't gain weight, but I can't eat all I want if I eat carbs. If I get back on carbs, I gain weight up. Like I was gaining some weight um, just eating some junk food now and again. There's an ice cream truck that comes by and they make this really good ice cream, so I was eating that pretty often. And I gained like seven pounds over the last six months or so, and I went back to just straight no carb, ditched all the grains and stuff, and I lost it all again in a few weeks. So it's pretty funny. (laughs) <laughs> it, it works so it works and uh, my sister has lost almost 80 pounds i'm going to interview her she's lost almost 80 80 pounds going on the same diet going for the uh the, the low carb primal thing but I mean, she lost 80 pounds eating bacon which is like exactly what they tell you you shouldn't do so, i don't know uh julian Dawes says the primal blueprint is solid tried it 13 years ago and i've been doing paleo and omega fat base for energy i follow a diet now based on i follow a diet now based on diet oh based on blood type dr mccola is the number one doctor for blood type diets yeah i don't know if i buy into the blood type diets um but uh i i do definitely believe that the uh 
the low carb thing is onto something. And I also think there's probably a bunch of glyphosate in the wheat and other things that may be causing issues. Also, the genetics of wheat are just ridiculously complicated now. Over time, a huge amount of genetics have accumulated in the wheat, so you know it's more complicated than human DNA. So. Christopher said, I was a heartburn sufferer too. I cut a lot of things out of my diet and intermittent fast. It was so dramatic that I sleep well enough to dream again. Yeah, man. Um, I could not believe If I eat wheat, if I eat a sub sandwich, I feel like I'm going to collapse. If I eat, I'm just like ill the rest of the day. And I could take the bread off it and eat the entire inside of it. I could eat a can of Spam and not feel like I'm going to collapse. But if I eat a sub sandwich, I mean, go figure. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Eat fresh. Liberty Not License says, I lost 70 pounds of fat, added 20 pounds of muscle, came off six meds and have normal blood pressure and cholesterol again with no arrhythmia, no sugar, almost no carbs, moringa and turmeric every day. Oh yeah, moringa and turmeric are the bomb. Raven says, look up anti-inflammatory diet if you have joint issues, etc. That's good. It's funny, as I, as I hit my 30s, my metabolism definitely slowed. I used to just sit and eat an entire pizza. I would drink Coke. Um, I can't do it anymore. Alan says, two new shirts in the last two streams. I think someone gave a super chat for that. Yes, thank you very much. I got the uh, Cubano style here. Bulletproof coffee, game changer. You know, I haven't tried that yet. I, I just kind of poured some um, some coconut oil into my coffee once just because I was kind of lazy about it. <clears throat> Carolyn says, I think gluten intolerance is actually glyphosate poisoning and nightshades cause fibromyalgia. It might be part of it. Yeah, I, I think the glyphosate's doing more than we think. Uh, Dub Smash 2016 says, Irish eat seven pounds of potatoes every day a hundred years ago and they were healthy. Yeah, that's true. They were also working their tails off and I don't know how healthy they were. I mean, um, I'm not going to say anything about the Irish. <laughs> my, my ancestors and the Irish did not get along very well. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Don't end up. Don't eat soy. Julian says you'll end up like the frogs. Exactly. Exactly. Chemicals in the water. Uh, I'm your huckleberry. Says does moringa need full sun? Mine is not growing. It's in mostly shade. Yeah, it really likes full sun. They love full sun. Um, they don't like the shade very much. They get really spindly and weak. Chip B says, oh man, I didn't know potato was nightshade and inflammatory. I love mashed potato. I avoid grains and make flour with dehydrated purple yams. Yeah, the, the, um, I like mashed potatoes too, but, uh, I, I will eat mashed yams now. The potatoes, I found out, like, I, my joints started hurting again the day after I ate a plate of homemade french fries. Like, I'm like, I made a bunch of french fries, fry them in coconut oil, and then I'm like, achy. So I just realized, okay, there we go. Social engineering. I should try the bulletproof coffee thing. I wonder if I could get all the ingredients. Uh, you could probably move the moringa, but it may die. It's it's so easy to start a new one from seed that it's worth um, you know try transplanting it. But I would also start some other ones from seed, or if you can cut a branch over it so it gets a little more light, that make a difference too. So I got to get ready to go, guys. Um, my wife is going to be waiting on me. I have a date tonight. I got to go out and play some guitar. And uh, and I will be back again tomorrow. I'll do it at the normal time tomorrow. I'm very sorry that... Uh, very sorry that uh, I started early today. But um, I've got to, I've got to put, take my wife out first. So let's see what we got here. You guys throw me some lyrics in the comments. And uh, I will sing the I will sing the comments out here. <clears throat> here we go, Derek. Nice to see you. All right. Wheat entirely organic, and the only grains we use are canola and oatmeal, rice too. Only wild meats like deer are truly free range chicken from farmers. We know personally. We do great. Glad I found this channel. I'll send you a video on how I make the coffee. I light a fire in my van. Thank you for tonight, DTG. Have a great evening. Brother Grains make me say, kiss your wife. Grains, then I walk on the sand. They're reading 
seven pounds of potatoes. <laughs> but they were never exposed to anything GMO. And the microbiome dysbiosis we have in our society with glycophate or meats you raise yourself. Have a groovy day and night. All right, guys. Have a great night. I, uh, I'll be back at the normal time next time. Thank you all for putting up with my foibles. And um, catch you guys very soon. And uh, ignore the food pyramid. And uh, next time, until then, may your thumbs always be green.